to create knowledge economies using market intelligence to forecast future trends. And chairing this session is Dr. John Law. We heard him yesterday and we'll be hearing from him again this morning as well. Now, Dr. Law is a higher education advisor with the British Council based in Manchester. He has over 25 years experience in the higher education sector and specializes in issues such as design and innovation, quality assurance, collaborative partnerships, research cooperation and internationalization. After graduating with a degree in industrial design from Edinburgh's Napier University, Dr. Law gained several years of experience as a practicing designer in the creative industries before joining the University of Central England, UCE in Birmingham, where he gained his PhD in design management. Now in the year 2000, he was appointed head of the Department of Fashion, Textiles and Three-Dimensional Design at UCE. And then in 2003, he moved to Hong Kong as the head of Department of Design at the Hong Kong Design Institute, where he was instrumental in delivering UK undergraduate programs with UK partner universities. Let's give him a big round of applause here, Dr. John. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Distinguished guests, Ladies and gentlemen, very warm welcome to day two of our conference. I hope you enjoyed the dinner last evening, and I trust that you're all refreshed and uh, ready for our second day of proceedings. It's my great pleasure this morning to introduce to you uh, Mr. Michael Peak, who's going to be addressing the topic of using market intelligence to forecast future trends. We heard from various different speakers yesterday about the importance of responding and adapting to change, whether it's the, the development of new curricula, or whether it's reshaping your learning environment. But responding to change can be an extremely difficult thing to do. If you ask an employer right now, about the skills that he would like his graduates to have in the creative industries, you could get a pretty, pretty good response from an employer about today's circumstances. Ask an employer about the skills and attributes you would want from his workforce in five years' time, and that's a very different story. That's why the work that Michael does is so important. He's the Education Research Manager at the British Council in Manchester with over seven years of experience in researching international higher education. He's been involved uh, centrally in the development and management of research projects covering different aspects of international education. Three notable publications recently. Student Insight, which was a global survey of over one 160,000 prospective international students. Students in Motion, which was a study which forecasts international student mobility. And the Global Gauge, measuring and benchmarking the internationalization activities of a range of different countries. More recently, Michael has co-authored The Shape of Things to Come, Higher Education Global Trends and Emerging Opportunities to 2020 piece of research which details the impact of demographic and economic drivers on the changing higher education landscape over the next decade. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you this morning Mr. Michael Peake. Um, good morning everybody and uh, thank you John for a very uh, warm introduction. Um, thank you everybody for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk to you this morning about um, education as a driver for, um, for knowledge economies. Um, it's an, education is a major contributor to the nation's wealth and economic development and um, so it's becoming increasingly important uh, for many countries around the world. 
what I wanted to talk to you this, about this morning for the next 25 minutes or so, and we'll have time for a discussion afterwards. Um, I want to talk about the main drivers for higher education enrolment globally, but also in terms of the drivers for international student mobility as well. Um, and looking at those, making predictions as to how the global higher education landscape is likely to change over the next 10 years or up to 2020, next eight years. Um, and as we see it, the way that the landscape will change will provide everybody with new opportunities for, for collaborating in teaching and research, international collaboration in teaching and research. So I will discuss that a little bit, but also I'll, I'll finish off with a couple of slides about how the importance of the national policies in place in different countries to enable these international collaborations. Um, and so talk about benchmarking policy indicators throughout Southeast Asia. So, just to summarise everything that I've rushed through, looking at the, the way that the international education landscape is likely to change to, to 2020 and beyond, countries, as, as I said, as I said um, the number of students engaging in higher education is likely it will continue to grow but at a much much slower rate so countries who had been export led uh, that means so the uk australia us countries which which recruit a number, a number of students a high number of students they're likely to shift their focus because the number of students is going to slow down student mobility is still an important consideration in, in the internationalization of higher education but it's not the only thing, and so um, many countries are going to be looking for opportunities more and more to engage in teaching collaborations and research collaborations. And to enable these opportunities to really bear fruit, it's important that the policies are in place to allow international engagement. But, as we've brushed over quickly, we know that the certain countries in this region have very ambitious targets and um, and so it's likely with, to meet these ambitious targets, the policy, it's likely that the policies in the different countries will enable um, a greater deal of international collaboration. I'm going to stop there um, and give us lots of time for questions and discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. Perhaps you'd like to join me. Okay, we've got time for uh, a couple of questions. If you'd like to ask a question, can I ask you to put your hand up and we'll get a microphone to you. Can you keep your question short, please? And uh, we've got a hand up in the front here. And can you just say who you are and where you're from, please? Hi, my name's uh, Eric Owens. I'm from Dumont for University in the UK. Um, a very interesting presentation and discussion about Thailand in international education. Well, um, over the last couple of years, I've tried to make a question of how you consider taking a, a semester or whatever in Thailand with cooperation with Thai universities, but the number of takers has been extremely small. And also the experience about the arrogance of things like Erasmus in Europe is that UK students are quite reluctant to travel to non English speaking countries. So, have you got any comments on whether you think there'll be a, a shift towards perhaps UK students studying overseas, or if there's anything you can do to encourage that? Okay, thank you. Uh, I think that's a good question, actually. In the, in the study that we did, with the shape of things to come, we actually, just looking at the economic and demographic indicators, we actually predicted, looking at those, that UK student outward mobility would, is likely to increase a little over the next eight years or so. I actually think as well, though, that the um, certain, certain policy changes are likely to shift the mindsets of UK students who have notoriously been quite reluctant in the past to engage in outward mobility. Um, I think that is likely to change. That's not really addressing your question, which is more about UK students going out as part of their UK degree. 
I think that there, I think that language is a, a big thing actually, and that the UK students in general are quite poor in terms of their language abilities. Um, I think though that what what could happen is basically with the, with the fee changes, I think that in general UK students will become more open to the idea of, of studying in countries other than the UK and that will filter through I think to students who are studying in the UK and give them different mindsets to think well actually I, I can do this as part of my, uh, I'm still going to study in the UK but I want the international experience as well so I, I, I think that perhaps a, perhaps a positive outcome of the fee changes in the UK is that it will shift the mindset of the UK students to become more open to looking elsewhere for the for their diploma mobility, but also that will filter through to to um, credit ability really in the short term study of I don't know if that answers your question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, gentlemen in the Middle of, ed of Education Youth and Sport of Cambodia. And actually, I'm also the resource person of the uh, CMOLI head project in uh, promoting a uh, credit transfer in the region and beyond. And I would like to ask uh, Michael about your opinion. Uh, how would you see the role of the regional credit transfer system in like internationalization or regionalization of higher education in the region? Please question specifically but I think it's very important to have um, systems set up to allow credit transfer because and that was one of the things that we took into account in, when in our global gauge study looking at this, um, comparing national policies in different countries we thought that <coughs> countries which had um, countries which recognized the qualifications from other countries and countries which allowed for credit transfer, or had systems in place to allow for credit transfer, that's a sign that these nations are perhaps more open to a deeper level of engagement and a deeper level of international engagement. So it's, it's more of an encouragement for students and academics, perhaps not so much academics, but it's more of an, an encouragement for students to, to to study internationally, to move around and to share ideas, to share their experiences and to share their knowledge. So actually, we took that credit transfer as an important indicator in how internationally ready a, a country is. So, um, so yes, it's, an, it's very important. I'll take one last question at the back. The statistics that you gave on uh, the percentage of international students, does this, in, does this number include uh, students that study at home but are in international programs? And does this also include short uh, certifications abroad? And if not, why? Thank you. The, the numbers that we looked at only included, um, the, num the numbers were taken from UNESCO Institute of Statistics in general, or OECD. Um, looking at diploma mobile students, so students who study abroad for a longer term and for a for a, a qualification in another in another, another country. So it doesn't include it doesn't include the transnational students, students staying at home to study a foreign qualification, and it doesn't include the short term study abroad students. Now. To answer the question, why not? <laughs> the, um, we thought it was important to have to look at internationally comparable numbers. So that's why we use the UNESCO database, which only which only considers the the longer term mobile students. Um, we did, we did. I particularly found it quite confusing when I was looking at the UNESCO data. And then also looking at national sources and looking at things like Project Atlas, which is um, um, an art, it's free to access uh, portal where you can see international student numbers. The, these other sources 
had higher numbers than we were dealing with because they included the short-term study abroad students as well. So, so that was quite confusing at times, but we thought it was important just to have internationally comparable numbers, so that's why we would use the UNESCO, which is the longer-term st uh, students, long-term mobile students. However, 